And scripture says, God blessed Noah and his sons. Mm -mm -mm. And God says to them, now it's interesting because if you remember in Genesis chapter 1, the first thing God did after he created Adam and Eve, first thing he did after creating humanity, he blessed them. See, God is all about blessing his people. Stay with me. God is... Well, I want to say greetings to everybody. Thanks for stopping in for a few moments tonight. I, I, I don't think this is going to be a super long uh, broadcast tonight, but I wanted to talk about something um, that I think might, might be an interesting uh, conversation. Of course, my name is Daryl. Arnez, and if you're watching live, welcome. If you're watching over on YouTube, welcome to you. If you're watching by the replay, uh, blessings to you. Thanks for stopping in for a couple of moments. Um, I want I wanted to come on tonight. I've I've been doing a bit of um, adjusting in my life. I've been doing a little bit of adjusting in my walk. And as a result of that, there there are some things that are kind of shifting around in my approach to some things and <clears throat> because some things have 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 been shifting i i think that it is only right that it is only appropriate um that with some of the things where my thinking and my believing has kind of shifted um i think it only right um that um i i clarify uh, a lot of the things that I say so that it doesn't bring any confusion to anybody, um, <clears throat> especially in the area of finances, in the area of what we have come to know as principles or laws of sowing and reaping and <clears throat> the idea of, of prosperity and when I speak about prosperity, of course, I recognize prosperity to, to mean an ongoing, uh, ongoing journey of prosperity, that the Father wants us to prosper spirit, soul, and body. So that, that's my understanding of prosperity, okay? That God wants us to prosper spirit, soul, and body. But the aspect of prosperity that I want to talk about tonight and even in dealing with um, the laws or the principles of sowing and reaping are going to deal specifically in the area of finance, in the area of money, um, which is one of those topics in the church that when, when and it has always been, you know, money becomes a very sensitive issue with people. Um, I am aware that there have been notable ministries in, in the body of Christ, especially over, let's say, the past 20 years. Um, many of them came out of the Word of Faith movement or what we know as the prosperity gospel, all right? Um, and I am aware that some individuals took things to an extreme. There, there are always extremes with anything that we talk about that has to do with scripture. There, there are always extremes. But for some reason, when it comes to the issue of money, when people take things to an extreme, it seems to be especially highlighted. It seems to be especially blown up you know, because people have abused certain biblical principles, people have used them for their own self gain. Uh, ministries have manipulated people in the area of giving. And as a result of that, what happens is people can reject the whole truth about it because of people that have taken things to an extreme. 
Now, here's what I find interesting. When it comes to the areas of, let's say, holiness, right? The, the doctrine of holiness or the teaching surrounding holiness. When the holiness movement hit, when, when the message of holiness really hit, people took it to an extreme, okay? Um, it went to such an extreme that women couldn't wear makeup. Women couldn't wear pants. Women couldn't wear jewelry. Women really couldn't do anything other than sit at home and have children, right? Men had to wear ties. Men had to do this. Men had to do that. It was the message of holiness taken to an extreme. And it had to swing back into balance to where we develop a biblical balance message of holiness. Now, at the same time, nobody just outright rejected the message of holiness because people took the holiness message to an extreme. Are y'all with me? Let's take another one. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right during the 1920s, the 1930s, that message also went to an extreme, so much so that people began to declare that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And some people still believe it, but that's not the message tonight, right? I'm just I just want to use a couple of different teachings. That you weren't saved unless you spoke in tongues. You weren't saved unless you were baptized in Jesus' name and spoke in tongues. You were not saved. People took the message of baptism to an extreme. You're not saved unless you're water baptized. Now, nobody just outrightly uh, denied it, right? Nobody outrightly denied baptism. Nobody outrightly denied tongues. Hello. Nobody outrightly denied sanctification. Nobody outrightly just flat out denied any other doctrine or any other teaching of the word of God. Because people took it to an extreme. But when it comes to the issue of money, when it comes to the issue of prosperity, now we have a problem because people have abused it, right? Some people don't want to deal with it at all. People don't, you know, as soon as you say prosperity, right? Flags begin to go off in the mind. I know because I've been there, right? Flags begin to go off in the mind like bells start ringing. There's something wrong. Um, somebody's talking about money, somebody's talking about taking an offering, something must be wrong here because people have taken it off into an extreme. Now, before I get into the teaching, let me, let me just, let me share a little bit of my testimony. Um, before I got saved, before I was born again, right, I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, as, as many of you all know. I grew up in an upper middle class African American community. My father was for all intents and purposes a pretty well off individual, okay? So I didn't really know anything about poverty. I didn't really know anything about lack. I didn't know anything about not be able to get what I want because my father and mother were in a financial con situation to where, well, let's just say I kind of grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth. So in my mind, this is the way everybody lived, right? Everybody lived in the suburbs. Everybody drove new cars, right? Everybody had boats. Everybody went fishing. Everybody took vacations. Everybody could travel. That's the life that I knew. All right. I was involved in music. I was playing music. Things were going well. Everything was cool. Right. I never knew that lack 
was real, stay with me, until I had my experience with Christ and I started getting involved in the church world, in the faith community, right? I thought that everybody explored their creativity. I thought that everybody valued education. I thought that everybody valued success. I thought that everybody valued, right, the good things of life. That, that, that's what I knew, okay? However, when I got involved in the church, what I began to hear, right, is that almost the poorer you were and the more you were struggling, the closer you were to God. Now, some of you all can relate to this. The more you're struggling, the poorer you are, the closer you are to God. Why? Because God doesn't want you to have things. There's something inherently wrong with things. There is something inherently wrong with having good stuff. There's something inherently wrong with this whole idea of wealth. There's something wrong with it, right? So everybody that seemed to have anything going on, right? These were the individuals that were somehow closer to the devil because in their mind, the devil, now y'all stay with me, in some people's mind, the devil is more apt to bless you than God is. Now, we don't say that. Stay with me. We don't say that outrightly, but in our actions and in our mentality, this is what we're saying. If you serve the devil, you'll have good stuff. If you serve the devil, you'll prosper. If you serve the devil, you can have wealth. If you serve the devil, you'll have success. If you serve the devil, you'll have a freedom of life. If you serve the devil, you'll experience the abundant life, right? Because that's all worldly. All right. So God's people, mm, mm, mm. God's people, somebody saying they grew up poor and never thought that way. That's a good thing, because what we're going to discover is that true prosperity has more to do with our mindset than it does anything else. But I'm going to get there in a minute. Right. I'm going to get there in a minute. So so what we had, we had churches not all churches. I'm talking about the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Things begin to shift in the 70s and the 80s because people were beginning to get an understanding of how to apply the word of God. Now, stay with me for a minute, right? Watch this. So what we had, we had churches, right? We had churches who were struggling to meet their bills. We had churches who were relying on fish dinners. We had churches that were relying on bake sales. We had churches that were relying on car washes. We had churches doing fundraisers with this and fundraisers with that and fundraisers with this because we know we need to get a new roof because the roof is leaking and, you know, on and on and on and on and on. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? All right. So, People began to understand from the scriptures that it was not the will of God for his people to have lack. Stay with me. They began to teach the principles of the scriptures, and I'm talking about money, finances. They began to teach the principles of the scriptures in order to change the mindset of the people towards the prosperity of God. And people began to apply the word of God. Yeah, they selling book A's. They, churches were selling everything and anything to raise money because nobody in the church had any. Y'all stay with me. Nobody, nobody in the church 
had no money. But we're trying to raise money to do ministry. Now, we don't have no money, but we want to do, we want to minister to the poor, but we don't have the finances that it takes to minister to the poor. If you're poor, it's hard to minister to the needs of the poor because you need resources to meet the needs of the poor. Does this make sense? All right, now y'all stay with me for a minute. So we had individuals that begin to be raised up that had an understanding that God gave an understanding of things like the blessing of Abraham, the word of faith, the principles of sowing and reaping, all of these things, right? And the mindset of people began to change. People began to prosper. People's mentality about things like success. People's mindset about things like, hey, I can actually own my own business. I don't have to work for somebody. I can own my own business and employ people, right? I can actually get to a place in life where if the church has a need, I can write the check for it. What a concept. I can write a check for it. We don't have to deal with fish dinners and chicken dinners and all of that stuff. Why? Because God's people have come into an understanding of prosperity. Are there people that took it to an extreme? Yes, it is. I'm the first one to acknowledge that there has been manipulation, there has been corruption, there has been abuse in dealing with the word of faith and the message of prosperity. But it's no different than the abuse that has taken place with anything else. There's been pastor abuse in the church, but we ain't throwing the pastors out, right? Are y'all with me? There's been abuse with ushers. We ain't throwing the ushers out. There has been abuse with everything in the scriptures, but it's not like we throw it all out. But when we begin to talk about money, when we begin to talk about money, there's an issue. Now, here's the next thing that I want to say. I was fortunate enough when I began to get involved with churches that I had a mindset towards money, towards prosperity, that I never bought into the poverty mentality in the church. I never brought into the idea that there was some additional holiness or righteousness attached to the idea of lack. I never bought into it, all right? And, and because of that, as God was continuing to lead me and to guide me, <coughs> he led me into a ministry <coughs> and into a church that taught a very balanced message of prosperity, right? And the, the core of that prosperity is this. Prosperity really doesn't have anything to do with how much money you have. Prosperity is more of a mindset than anything else, okay? So you can have all the money in the world and not necessarily be prosperous, right? That's not the point, all right? Prosperity is a mindset, but I'm talking about money. So I'm going to stay on the money piece, all right? I have never been poor and never will, right? I will always be able to have resources. Why? Number one, because there is an abundance in the world. There is no lack in the world. Lack is also a mindset. I'm going somewhere. Lack is also a mindset. Poverty is a mindset. Lack is a mindset. And you make the choice as to what your mindset is going to be. All right. So as I began to understand something about the principles of the word, and I'm talking the 80s now, right? Because that's kind of when I was really, you know, reading after and studying and, and, and examining some of the prosperity teachings. It was kind of during the 80s. I saw the abuses in it then, right? 
I saw the abuses in the Word of Faith movement. I understand that the abuses are there, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the biblical truth regarding the Word of Faith, right? It has nothing to do with the biblical truth regarding faith and confession. It has absolutely nothing to do with it, all right? So I was kind of blessed in that respect, all right? Now, one of the other things that I began to, to discover, and this was more when I started doing my theological studies, right? One of the things that I began to study because I really examined healing, um, the theology of healing throughout church history, right? So I wanted to have an understanding of healing, the healing movements, and, and what's the basis of healing. And this is when I began to discover the fact that healing, divine healing, is in the atonement. The same salvation that Jesus died, or the same death that he died to secure salvation, it also purchased divine healing. So divine healing is part of the package, all right? Stay with me. One of the questions that we really had to examine was if healing is a part of the atonement, how come all people aren't healed? All right? How come all people aren't healed? If healing is part of the atonement, how come all people aren't healed? Now, people begin to teach if you're not healed, there's a lack of faith. If, there's not, if you're not healed, there's some hidden sin in your life. If you're not healed, there's something wrong with the person or the people that are praying for you, right? And so we try in our mind to figure out how come all people aren't healed. I have come to the point in my life right now, right? Right now. I don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer for why all people that are prayed for or why all people who are believing for healing, right? Why they are not all healed. I don't have an answer. But what I do know is that Jesus purchased healing for all people. And healing is a part, a part of the atonement. Why all people aren't healed, I don't have an answer for. I'm just being honest, right? But I cannot bring the word of God, I cannot bring the teaching of divine healing down to the level of the experience of people, right? We cannot bring the word of God down to human experience. We have to allow human experience to rise to the standard of the word of God. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, the same thing applies, the same thing applies when it comes to financial prosperity. Same thing applies. The word of God teaches financial blessing and I'm gonna look we're gonna look at some scriptures about this in a minute the scriptures teach financial blessing the scriptures teach that God says scripture tells us the blessing of the Lord it makes rich and he doesn't add any sorrow with it now we now many people try to spiritualize it away and say well he's talking about spiritual riches no he's he's using rich in the sense of material wealth right so the scriptures clearly teach that so so we could ask ourselves just like with divine healing well if biblical prosperity is true and god wants to prosper all of his people and god wants all his people to be financially solvent let's use that word he wants all of his people to be financially well off how come people how come all people that sow and reap haven't prospered why are there people who have sown seed all their life but they died poor why are there people who gave and didn't receive in return? Why are there people that are believing God for financial prosperity, but they're not prospering? So that must mean that there's something wrong with the teaching of prosperity. 
No, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with the teaching of financial prosperity any more than the fact that all people aren't healed disproves or there's something wrong with the teaching on divine healing. We cannot bring the word of God down to the level. Hear me. We cannot bring the word of God down to the level, okay, of human experience. Many people or some people may have, some people may have a subconscious issue about prosperity. Some people may have a subconscious problem with money. And although that they're going through the actions of money, of giving, of doing this, of doing that, of saying that they're believing for prosperity, right? Now, let me say this. Let me say this because I want to differentiate between biblical prosperity and a lot of things that are taught that are more new agey, right? Because there are some things that are taught that are kind of new agey that goes beyond what the scripture says. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about getting into mysticism and spiritualism and all of that stuff, right? Right? That's not what I'm talking about, all right? So just keep that in mind, right? Now, because there are people that have gotten off into that, that doesn't invalidate biblical prosperity, you know, either. So I'm just saying, all right? Now, where was I? We can't bring the word of God down to the level of our human experience. Now, the principle, right? <laughs> the principle of prosperity, the principle of sowing and reaping, the principle of sowing and reaping is 100% biblical, all right? I am not talking about mind science. I'm not talking about science of the mind. There are people that have taught it from that perspective, but that's not what I'm talking about, right? So don't, don't think that's where I'm going. It's not where I'm going, all right? I'm not talking about a mind science. I'm talking about a biblical principle that works. I'm talking about a biblical principle that's actually established in nature itself. The principles of sowing and reaping, it is both a natural and a spiritual law. It works either way, all right? It works either way, right? Sowing and reaping, right? Now, if you, let me give you an example, and somebody mentioned it. We have been taught and we have heard for a long time that the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil, right? Or money is the root of all evil. That's what we've been taught. Money is the root of all evil. And that's not what scripture teaches. The love of money, they say, is the root of all evil. The money is neutral. Money is neither good or bad, all right? Money is neutral, all right? Money is just neutral. Now, the love of money is the root of all evil, all right? So I'm trying to keep this balanced, all right, is, is what I'm trying to do, all right? I'm really trying to keep this balanced. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'll put it like that. I'm trying to keep this balanced right now, all right? So in the beginning, here's the Bible doesn't teach that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil because it has to do with the motive of the heart is what is what it gets into the motive of the heart. Now, at the same time, you do not have to be super spiritual to operate in the biblical principles of prosperity. All right. You don't have to have some kind of deep spiritual revelation, some kind of deep spiritual mystical approach to biblical prosperity. It's, it's a really simple principle, right? It's built into the creation itself. And I kind of covered this 
last night, right? Um, so I'm going to read the verse again. And then I want to look at some things in the life of Abraham, who is the father of faith. All right. I want to look at some things in Abraham. Then I want to look at something in the experience of the children of Israel. All right. Because we're going to see this principle at work and we're, we're, we're really going to see how far removed the church has become from biblical prosperity in terms of money with the poverty mentality. All right. So what God did when he created the earth, right? So verse, verse 11 God said, let the earth bring forth tender sprouts, the herb seeding seed and the fruit tree producing fruit after its own kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth tender sprouts, the herb yielding seed after its kind and the tree producing fruit after its kind, whose seed is is in itself and God saw that it was good. Now, here's the here is the principle of sowing and reaping in the opening chapter of Genesis. And note, he's talking about the earth. This is not high spirituality. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a very basic principle that works just in nature. Right? So, what we have is this. We have the earth bringing forth sprouts, the herb yielding seed, keep that in mind, yielding seed after its kind, and the tree producing fruit after its kind, whose seed was in itself. Everything in nature brings forth after its own kind the seed is in itself so it's almost like saying this y'all stay with me when 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 god created nature i just want to let's just deal with it in the natural when god created nature he did it once does that make sense he only created it once Right. He created it once, but he built into nature the ability to reproduce itself. So he created the trees. He created the plants. He created the this. He created the that. He did it once. The seed of the thing is in itself. It reproduces after its own kind. Humanity reproduces thank you for that uh, super heart it reproduces after its own kind it doesn't have to be recreated over and over and over it's the principle of seed time and harvest it's the principle of the seed the seed is in itself all right y'all y'all with me so far that's in the book of Genesis. It was established in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. All right. Now, we're going to move forward a little bit. And I want to look at it again. Because you will remember. Whether you, uh, you, know, whether you agree that it's literal or not. I'm going to talk about it. If you don't believe this is literal, that's fine. The principle holds true. Right. Somebody is pointing out that. He told us as people that we were to go forth and multiply. Even humanity has within itself the seed of reproduction. So we can't really deny the principle of seed faith, of sowing and reaping, or just the principle of the seed itself all right now you will remember noah's flood right whether you believe it's literal or not you know that's not that's not you know that's not my my argument or anything like that i just want to point something out all right so after noah came out of the ark 
right after Noah came out of the ark and it's interesting that when Noah went into the ark God told him to take two of every kind of animal why so that they could reproduce why because the seed of their repopulation was in the animal itself right so God only needed God only needed to do he only needed to do it one time that's all he had to do. He did it one time and he established the law and he established the principle, right? Now, here's the thing, because if we can really get a hold of this whole idea of seed faith, right? Sowing and reaping, a lot of us could really begin to see some dr dr dramatic changes and shifts in our life, not just financially, but in a lot of other areas, all right? Because we have to apply the principles of the word of God to do what it is we're here to do. All right. Now, again, I'm not talking about the kingdom being a 401k where we're just going to sow 30 or 40 dollars into the kingdom. And then God is just going to miraculously drop it out of the heavens. That's not what I'm talking about. There are some things that we have to do. There are some things that we have to do. Y'all stay with me for a minute. Y'all stay with me. Noah comes out of the ark. Right? He comes out. And scripture says, God bless Noah and his sons. Mm -mm -mm. And God says to them. Now it's interesting because if you remember in Genesis chapter 1. The first thing God did after he created Adam and Eve, first thing he did after creating humanity, he blessed them. See, God is all about blessing his people. Stay with me. God is all about...